I'm a postdoc here, and I'm, gonna, I mean, I'm going about to show you is the work that we have been doing here in Santa Cruz uh, with a lot of other collaborators from the Candle Survey. It's the analysis uh, of what we think happens in the formation of the first quiescent galaxies. Um, so during these 15 minutes, I hope I'll be able to convince you um, that forming a quiescent galaxy is not just about stopping the star formation or stopping the GANs info preventing the galaxy to form new star. It also implies a significant change in the structure of galaxies, something that turns uh, disturb this clumpy disk, irregular like this, into something round, spheroidal, like these so-called red nuggets. So to give you a little bit more of introduction, I'm going to show you this uh, figure from Steinwoods, where I think nicely summarizes a lot of the properties of galaxies at intermediate and high redshift. So you can see uh, in this y-axis star formation rate versus mass, and the white line indicates uh, the so-called main sequence, so the correlation between star formation rate and star mass for star forming galaxies. And you can see that pretty much at every redshift, since uh, redshift around zero to higher redshift, um, there is a correlation, there is a main sequence of star forming galaxies, but at the same time, more or less at the same masses, there is another relation with lower star formation rates that is uh, the sequence of quiescent galaxies, or death sequence, if you like. So both uh, this bimodality between star forming and quiescent galaxies exist up to very high red sieves, but what you can see color coded in this diagram is the size of the galaxies. And you can see that for any given mass, for example here, uh, quiescent galaxies are always smaller than the star forming analogs of the same mass. Uh, in other words, Star forming galaxies are larger, quiescent galaxies are smaller, smaller and compact. So in order to form a quiescent galaxy, it's not just a matter of quenching, so stopping star formation, there must be something, on, uh, something else going on that changes the structure of the galaxy. So to investigate this process, uh, we grab a sample of candles data, which includes uh, some of the most fantastic, deepest uh, HST photometry in a lot of the so-called deep fields. And it also includes a lot of far infrared photometry that allowed us uh, to compute very accurate red sieve, star masses, but also star formation rates. And we study a sample of galaxies between red sieve 1.4 to, th uh, to 3. And in the figure of the left, we can see uh, a specific star formation rate versus mass diagram, where the y-axis is reversed to make it look like the more familiar uh, color mass diagram. In this case, at higher red sieve, we use the specific star formation rate because many of these galaxies are dusty. So if we were to use just the color, uh, all the galaxies will be blend. Especially the massive galaxies, all of them will be red because they are very dusty. So using star formation rate tracers that include both the UV and also the infrared to uh, tackle the re-emission of the dust uh, at longer wavelengths, we are able to determine more accurate star formation rates and draw a diagram like this that looks like the familiar color mass. So just by drawing a line here, we can uh, we have this threshold that divides very cleanly the sample of quiescent and star-forming galaxies. So we focus on a sample that is more massive than 10 to the 10, so it's only just the blue and red dots here. And we divide the sample between star-forming and quiescent, and then we look at the structure of this galaxy. So here we have size versus mass. And again, we can see in blue and red the galaxies that were star-forming and quiescent in the other diagram. So you can see and uh, has been shown in many other uh, papers before, that star-forming galaxies follow a different scaling relation from quiescent galaxies. In um, particular, quiescent galaxies are very small and seem to follow a mass size relation uh, with a very uh, a relatively stable slope that doesn't change uh, very much uh, during red sieve. And it just simple sifts up as, this, as if these galaxies were just becoming larger, uh, preserving the slope uh, in this relation with stellar mass. So at higher red sieve, you can see here the uh, lines coming from Newman et al. and at lower red sieve uh, from Shen et al. And you can see the more or less the mass size relation is always the same. It just sifts up, so the zero point goes higher. So at, higher, at lower red sieve, quiescent galaxies will lie in this relation. They will be larger. And at higher red sieve, they're very small and compact. So what we're doing to investigate how the evolution takes place is we divide this sample and we, similarly to the threshold in star formation rate to make quiescent and star forming, we make another threshold here and we call compact to all the galaxies that are to the right of this line and extended to all the galaxies that are to the left of this line. So we can combine these two diagrams and we can explore the quiescence or star forming activity in these galaxies and then we are looking simultaneously at if they are extended or compact. So all the galaxies here will be in this side of the diagram and all the other ones will be here. So in the end, the question that we want to answer is how galaxies go from extended and star forming to compact and quiescent. Do they shrink and as a result of this transformation they stop forming stars or they simply stop forming stars because they run up of fuel or, or there's some kind of feedback going on, but then they suffer this transformation because of mergers. Okay, so we're going to divide this sample 
in different red shift to try to uh, draw a timeline and see how the evolution of these different samples uh, evolves with time. And we're going to break uh, this sample into different red shift bins that more or less uh, cover uh, the same time in the evolution of the universe so that the number of galaxies that you see in the diagram uh, it's more or less represents more or less the same density as a function of red shift. So we start the highest red shift and I think the most striking result is first there are very few quiescent galaxies. This is to be expected because at a highest red shift we expect that not many of these galaxies have been formed yet. And the other striking result is that there seem to be quite a few compact star forming galaxies lying below this region of compact quiescent galaxies. Okay? And the other important result is that many of these galaxies seem to be detected in the X-ray. So both the Quiescent and the star forming galaxies seem to have a very high activity of AGN. Uh, whether this is related to the quenching of the galaxies or not, it's something that we cannot fully uh, resolve from this analysis. Uh, but it's certainly telling us something about the growth of AGNs together with these massive galaxies. And it's certainly telling us that in these compact galaxies, when galaxies go into this compact mode and suffer this transformation of a structure, the incidence of, of AGN is significantly higher. Okay, so I'm going to show you what happens when you go to lower red shift. And if we just move, uh, I think the first thing you, you can see is a significant increase in the density of quiescent galaxies. Uh, whereas the number density of compact star forming still increases, we still see a lot of AGN activity going on, and it seems like this uh, population is shifting up and making a lot of the new compact quiescent galaxies. So if you were to populate this uh, upper part of the diagram, it will seem like these compact, uh, compact star forming galaxies were just quenching and moving up in this sequence, forming the first, or a th forming a book of the new quiescent population. So this trend seems to go on uh, to a slightly lower red shift, and it stops roughly around red shift of 1.5. So a red shift around 1.5, there is a significant, there's a dramatic change in this trend. And we can see it in the next slide that there are barely any compact star forming galaxy, whereas you can still see the remains of the compact quiescent population. So these galaxies may still be growing by a menor margin that was mentioned this, this morning uh, and moving. Uh, back to the extended region, but what we certainly don't see is a lot of compact star forming galaxies that may be making these co compact quiescent galaxies. So at lower red shifts, it seems like uh, many other quiescent galaxies may be formed coming from the extended region, so straight up from here and up, but that's something that uh, Jerome will probably mention before, uh, later, um, and because we think that perhaps there is something changing in the structure of these galaxies, but only on the inner part, in the bulge of these galaxies, but that's something that he will explain in more detail. But at least at higher red shift, it seems like the track to form the first quiescent galaxies is via compact star forming galaxies that disappear uh, very rapidly below red shift of 1.5. So a summary of this trend uh, will be in this kind of cartoon where you can see that galaxies will evolve from extended, irregular, perhaps clumpy disks, and then will become something small and compact round like the quiescent galaxies, but they still start forming, very star forming. In fact, these galaxies are detected in far infrared wavelengths with high star formation rates and are among the most star forming galaxies of the universe at that time. And then they will quench in a short period of time and they will make the quiescent population. So looking in more detail about uh, the number density of both populations with time, we make this diagram here that in red shows the evolution of the number density in compact quiescent galaxies that uh, as you can see, grows very rapidly from Red Sea 3, where we could see uh, very few of these galaxies then increases. And we're saying that this population is the result of the quenching of these compact star forming galaxies. So the number of compact star forming galaxies, the number density is this one here. So we can play a simple game and say that uh, the red line here is the cumulative distribution of the blue line. And this means that all of these galaxies here, we're going to suppose that all of these galaxies are going to quench, disappear, and become these red ones. And all of these blue ones are new compact star forming galaxies that are presumably coming from this region of the diagram. So all of these blue are going to disappear and turn red, and so on. And these new blue are coming from the other side of the diagram. So if we assume that this red line is then a cumulative distribution, and that all the blue squares are going to disappear in periods of time of around 300 million years to one giga year, then we can reproduce the shape of the red line with these black curves. So for time scales of roughly 300 to one giga year. So if these galaxies have quenching times consistent with this period of time, then we can reproduce the number density of compact quiescent galaxies based on this population solely. 
Okay, so to investigate this in a little bit more detail, so in our first paper, we only investigate the number density of, of these galaxies. So what we said to do is uh, draw a sample of these galaxies in one of our deepest fields and get the best information possible to do an analysis of the star formation rate, the obscuration, and the stellar population of these galaxies to determine whether their quenching times, the time that it takes for them to go from the main sequence of star forming galaxies to the quiescent dead sequence here, if these times are consistent with the picture that we're trying to derive from the number density. Uh, so in this figure, I'd also like to highlight that, well, first you can see that as I was saying before, uh, the incidence of AGN is quite high. It's roughly 40 or 50% of the sample. Uh, but you can see that these galaxies are detected in the far infrared wavelengths, both in uh, MIPS, but also in longer wavelengths in Herschel. Uh, they're very obscure, and if they're really uh, the um, progenitor population of quiescent galaxies, it means that the formation of the first quiescent galaxies involve a very dusty phase. So all of these galaxies went to a very dusty phase, and together with the quenching or whatever caused the quenching of the galaxies also caused the galaxy to lost a lot of this dust. Okay, so we analyzed in detail the stellar populations of these galaxies using uh, in particular three different uh, models of stellar population of three different, sorry, star formation histories. And in the figure of the left, I'm showing the comparison drawn from the typical uh, star formation history is the most widely used in the, in the literature, which is just uh, exponentially declining single tau models or delay models, which are simply, they're just like the exponentially declining, but they have an early phase of growth uh, where the star formation is going up and then uh, reach up you and then goes down very rapidly. So they're very similar, and as you can see, they produce a very similar evolution in the mass and the star, in the star formation rate mass diagram. And um, you can see, uh, just by looking at this diagram, it looks like uh, neither of these models reproduce very well the slope of the main sequence. So it would look like uh, these galaxies will move very rapidly here, then they will cross the main sequence and they will go down very rapidly. So they are not very realistic in terms of reproducing the early stages of evolution, and we've been known this for quite a long time. So uh, the other thing that we try to do here is use a slightly different models of uh, sterile evolution and slightly different star formation histories. And what we did is we draw a library of star formation histories from seminalytic models. So we take the evolution of galaxies derived from this uh, uh, cosmological simulations, and that's what I'm showing you here. Uh, so these blue lines show the fit to the uh, star formation histories of these galaxies, and these evolutions up and down are what the models of uh, dark matter and galaxy assembly, assembly predict. So you have these characteristic spikes that are shown in the simulations when the galaxies suffer an accretion event or when they shut down a star formation. So we model all the galaxies with the three different star formation histories, and then we study how long it will take for all of these galaxies to go from basically the main sequence, or where they are right now, down to the quiescent region, here and from here for the three of them. And surprisingly, well, let me start with the exponentially declining first. So for the exponentially declining models, it seems like the predictions are roughly consistent with the times that we were predicting from the number density evolution. So we could reproduce the picture that we were saying. Uh, but it looks like this, uh, the, the star formation histories drawn from the semi-analytic models uh, are too long. So if galaxies were living uh, these star formation histories, they will experience going up and down, and they w it will take too long for them to go into the red sequence. Uh, we think this is related with the characteristic of the library that we draw from the uh, semi-analytic models, is that most of these galaxies uh, are at redshift zero, so they show the star formation histories of typically these galaxies in the local universe that are long-lived, uh, so they may not be very representative of the short star formation histories of these galaxies that will go down very rapidly. Um, so I don't have time to show that in much detail. Uh, we're preparing a paper showing these results. So uh, at this point, I just want to focus on uh, the results of these two other models that at least allows us to reproduce the short quenching of these galaxies. And we can see that if we evolve this population in time according to the uh, best fit ages that we have here, um, we get this number density. So if we evolve this sample of roughly 50 compact star forming galaxies according to the best fit star formation histories, the number densities will line up almost perfectly with the density of compact quiescent galaxies at redshift 2. So if we let them evolve, they will all disappear, they will all become quiescent galaxies by redshift 2, and the number density will reproduce very well what we observe. Okay, so in the final part of this talk, I just want to highlight some comparison to the models, so I hope that by now I will convince you that the intermediate evolutionary stage between these two is compact star forming galaxies, and they will quench very rapidly and turn into red nuggets. But there's still one remaining question, which is how do you form the compact 
star forming galaxies in the first place. So, so far the most popular mechanism to do this is A, major mergers and then disk instabilities that have been mentioned this morning again. So we know major mergers can do this. There have been many studies showing that. Uh, the problem is that at this red we think we're not finding uh, signatures or, or uh, information that there are enough major mergers to produce all the compact galaxies that we uh, see. So let me pitch disk instabilities for a little bit and I think the beauty of disk instabilities is that they are very widespread phenomena so all of these galaxies at this red seed, the star forming may experience disk instabilities whether they these disk instabilities end up forming a compact galaxy is something that we have to explore because sometimes the instability may trigger and then stop and there's not necessarily that they're going to make a very compact galaxy. They may just grow the bulge of the galaxy and still keep forming a disk. But this phase of this instability seems to be very widespread uh, in these galaxies. So let me show you just two comparisons, two models. Uh, the first is in the semantic models of uh, Somerville et al. And this is a paper by Porter et al. in preparation that she's been doing here with Joel Primack. So this is a comparison on the evolution of galaxies that are going to be compact forming galaxies at Red Sea around two. And here I'm showing the same diagram where I was just showing the evolution at the, in the first two slides. So what I'm going to show you is uh, how the models predict these galaxies are going to evolve. And it looks certainly very, uh, very realistic. It looks a lot like the picture that we were showing in the first slide. So galaxies go from being uh, extended and start forming, compact and start forming, and then quench and become quiescent. And it seems like in these models that include both mergers and disk instabilities, at least more than half, probably 60% of the sample, will go into the compact region because of disk instabilities. And it's true that semiotic models include recipes, so these are just based on prescriptions that seem to work for disk instabilities. So we take a closer look at real simulations of uh, the art code, and in particular, we found four galaxies uh, in the simulations of Severino and Deco. Uh, and what I'm showing you here is the evolution in size and mass of three of these galaxies, and for each galaxy, I'm showing in a different color two stages. The stage where the galaxy was larger, uh, an unstable clumpy disk and the phase where the galaxy was smaller, a compact, we think, star forming galaxy. And you can see that they go up from here, they suffer this shrinkage uh, event and in this case, for example, it will go from this area here where they were st extended star forming galaxies to form compact star forming galaxies. So we think these mechanisms are, po are possible. We are still investigating uh, the mechanism that will trigger that in this galaxy, but certainly it will be related with instability. You can see certainly a lot of clumps in this galaxy that will cause also a lot of gas inflow to the center, will trigger a star formation there, it will make the galaxy much more compact. Um, and this is something that we still have to quantify, we're still working in that, but certainly the picture is quite appealing. You can see that at least from a few selected examples we can see how galaxies shrink. And although the model doesn't include quenching yet, and that's what happens to these galaxies that accrete gas once more and they grow again, uh, we certainly can reproduce a phase where the galaxies will shrink and form uh, compact remnants. So I'm going to conclude just leaving you this cartoon that summarizes more or less what I've been showing and the uh, comparison to the models and the properties of the compact star forming galaxies. Okay, thank you. Take a couple of questions. Yes. Um, can you measure shape distributions for these compact galaxies? Are they, are they just too? Oh, we can measure different sizes. I don't have a, a slide here with the size distribution, but we are showing an histogram where we study the distribution, the size distribution of both the compact quiescent and the compact star forming, and they seem to follow more or less the same distribution. They seem to lie in the mass size relation of the quiescent galaxies that I was showing at the beginning. Uh, I meant the axial ratios. Oh, the axial ratios? Yes, yes. And uh, they're also very similar. So I, we find a trend in which, well, let me show you just one slide where I can highlight the different appearance of these galaxies. So most of them are round and spheroidal like the, like the quiescent galaxies. But you can see that the most massive, they're kind of elongated. Uh, they might look like inclined disk. But we've seen this trend also in the most massive quiescent galaxies. So there have been people reporting that the axis ratios of the most massive quiescent galaxies are also small. So they seem to follow more or less the same distribution of the other population. Yes. Yeah, earlier you showed the two plots on the left. It was tau models and blade 
models versus SAMs and the book. To me, like, yeah, the SAMs reproduce the slope of the main sequence. Yes. Better. Um, what qualitatively would be different about the SAM, the star formation histories and the SAMs compared to, say, an exponential model? So the SAMs will have a smoother star formation history, so it, it won't, in the case of the delayed, it wouldn't increase so fast. It will increase more slowly and it wouldn't have a, a strong peak. So in general, it will be uh, a more temperate uh, star formation history. It will grow slowly and it will also decrease slowly. The problem, so it reproduces very well the slow and that's uh, certainly an advantage. The only problem is that it also decreases very slow. So we'll predict quenching times that are far too long. So, but we suspect that this is a bias on the library. If we can find star formation history of really quenched galaxies, we suspect that this will show us a tr truncation, a fast truncation after the star formation of history. This is not the same SAM that worked so well. It's yes. SAM. Yes. This is, the other SAMs are just drawn from the millennium simulation for the purpose of star formation histories. Yeah.